Okay, well, I want to uh, thank all of you for coming to our evening at the North Wind Warehouse, where we, we this is our plant production site. And over the last 30 years, our maximum production was 450,000 plants a year. We've narrowed that down to about 60,000 a year that we grow. And basically, we, we don't, to be open about what we do, we don't, we don't grow fashion plants. The industry can take care of that. We grow plants that have garden value and, have quite, and live in good relationships when we understand how to place them together they can live well together. And then when they live well together, they also reduce what people call yard work and turn yard work into joyful gardening. Because the plants are more responsible for their own well-being when they live placed together socially so they can grow into each other, become adults, and not inhibit their neighbors from light energy and water and nutrient resources. So it's kind of cool that we have this ability to do this and when I first started doing this, I had no idea how to do this. I've never taken a class in horticulture. I'm an outdoor ed teacher. So everything I learned was hit or miss in the late 70s. And then asking questions. I went to the Morton Arboretum and questioned everybody. And the people at that time at the Morton Arboretum loved people with questions. There was a unique group of, they still do, but at that time in the late 70s, they, they, if you had questions, they had time for you. They always would be there, and I really learned a lot uh, because of the group of people that were there at the time. So I'll show you what we do. And first of all, sowing seeds. I didn't know how to sow seeds. I never sowed seeds as a child. I didn't garden. I played baseball and just hung out in the alley and did stuff. So when I started learning, I said, well, how do you sow seeds? What, how do you do this? And the simplest thing I was shown was you get a flat with drainage holes. You don't want a flat that doesn't have drainage holes because then the flat will fill up with water and your seeds will rot. You need to create a soil mix that has oxygen and nutrients. So you want, and that's where the little piece of perlite, vermiculite or pine bark, that creates space in the soil. So you have oxygen. Without oxygen, you don't get root development. And then without nutritional value, you don't get the plant development. So you have a, a nutrient charge and everything in here in this mix is found on earth, but it's actually fake. It's a mix of peat moss, pine bark, and perlite, and it creates, you want good drainage, we want good drainage because I can't control the weather. I've never grown anything in a greenhouse. I've, I've, we have hoop huts that look like greenhouses. So what I discovered was I don't need a greenhouse. In 1979, <clears throat> they said, Where's your, how are you gonna grow anything without a greenhouse? Well, that's a misleading thing. The misleading thing is people think you need to have a greenhouse to grow something. But what you do is you ask the plants, you say, what is it you need to have a good life so I could, I could grow and produce you and put you into a situation that you can be mobile in a container and go to other people's homes? Because that's what a container is. It's a form of mobility. It's like a car. The plant goes from here to your house into the earth and then has a good, a good life once it gets into the earth. So basically what we start with <clears throat> was a well-drained soil mixed with a nutrient charge. I would fill the flat like this. I'd have WGN on the radio with Wally Phillips in the morning. So Wally would be talking about jokes and he'd be sharing the day with me and I'd have a quart of orange juice right here. I'd start at about five in the morning sowing seeds. Sun would be coming up, the birds would be singing and it was just a great day to be alive. So I, I flattened it out like this, and I'd be, then I made this tamper in 1981. This is it. And I would tamp down the soil like this. Lay my tamper open, I'd go to my seeds and see what I had in the bag. I'd have everything labeled. You gotta remember to label everything so you know what you're sowing. And this is mouse-eared Coreopsis. It's Coreopsis auriculata nina. It's a dwarf Coreopsis native to the eastern part of the United States. So then I take the seeds in my hand, and when I had them in my hand the first time, most people are always wondering, when is, what, what, when is magic going to happen in my life? And for some people, magic is winning the lottery, 
Magic is getting the right person to marry you. Magic is having children. So when I look at this, and I can actually grow a plant and have it in a one gallon container the same year, to me this has always been magic. To take something that looks like dust that you shake off a broom into a trash can. So, so I would take these seeds, I just scatter them on the soil, the soilless mix. And I'm actually miss, missing one step. Gabino, could you get me some vermiculite? Okay. And Gabino, see that man walking there? He can grow anything. <laughs> He's, he can grow any, well, he grow in his production field. So the respect that man deserves, he can grow anything. He does all of this with two, two and a half people. And we have three people on weekends that sort the containers. So I've got two and a half people, Gabino and Robert. Everything you see is them. And then the three people on weekends sort the pots, clean the pots, and water retail. So it's not that we need a heck of a lot of guys to do. We could use two extra people to do, because <laughs> we're going to be doing sedges. And the same holds true for all the North. When, when you look at our, we got a great retail staff that knows plants, shares their knowledge, talks to everybody. And, and it's not like we have, it's just that they love what they do, and they're nice enough to share who they are with us. And that's the important part of how they. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So after I put the seeds on, I got way too many here. This would go into the next flat. So I just scatter the seed on top of the soil. And then I cover the seeds with this is coarse vermiculite. Now inside, it, outside it blows around. When I'm inside the building, the production hut, I cover the seed with the coarse vermiculite. The coarse vermiculite keeps the soil and the seeds evenly moist, but it lets sunlight through because the seeds need sunlight to germinate. Because it's, it's only about an eighth of an inch thick. And sunlight can almost penetrate two and a half, three inches of the earth. What is vermiculite? Vermiculite, vermiculite is a, 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 it's, it's a rock that they explode with heat. It's, out, it's done out east. Somehow there's a rock, or I don't know the name of the rock, but it's a, a, like a, sh, a sh, slate layer. They heat it up. But they make it out of like a natural. Yeah, it's a rock. For, it's a rock, so it all explodes. And it holds moisture, not as, not as much as peat moss. So then I cover the flat. I take the flat outside. I put it on the cart, still protected from the wind, because the wind would be blowing the vermiculite everywhere. Then I water it with the water and can I just go over it like this. I start the water here. If I start the watering over the flat, it's like bombs dropping on it and disturbed. So I start here and just go back and forth like this. And then when the cart is full, I have about eight flats on the cart. I take it to the hoop house that we have with the shade, 30% shade cloth. I walk in here. I put it down in the corner here. And I just keep doing flats all day. And now Gabino's taking that over. He does most of the seed sowing. And we move the, the flats in there. Then I'll water them again and soak them really good with a very gentle nozzle. And I discovered when I started germinating seeds in 1979 that 30% shade cloth was all you needed. 50% shade was too much. And the seedlings would be too leggy and floppy. And you can't germinate them out in the sun because if you get a heavy rain, they destroy the seedlings. It just wipes out the seed flats. And what I did in 1979, the church in St. Charles was throwing all their window screens out in the dumpster. So I got all the window screens out of the dumpster. I was at the natural garden. I put plywood on the ground. I put cinder blocks. I put the window screens over the cinder blocks and put a brick on each window screen so they didn't blow away. And I took the seed flats and slid them under the window screens. And at the end of the day, all the seeds were germinating and I got everything for free. And, and I knew I needed that kind of protection. I learned that at Midwest Ground Covers. They were so free with their knowledge about how to grow something. And they were growing seeds of uh, the roadside 
um, crown vetch. They grew crown vetch from seed and sold that to the highway department to plant along the bridges. And they showed me how to do that. So the 30% shade cloth represents the window screens from the church that I got for free crawling in the dumpsters. So I learned by doing and then found this 30% shade. And this shade cloth has lasted us over 22 years. The sun breaks it apart, but Gabino goes in there with strips and fastens all the shade cloth back together. So there is some mending that we have to do, but that's just part of what we do is the mending. And, and, and that way it, it just keeps us aware of who we are, aware of kind of what we need to do to grow the plants. And after you put the seed flat in, you wait about four to six to eight weeks, and then you get a seed flat. So this is our, this is a flat of Baptisia sphericarpa. This is the yellow Baptisia. Look how beautiful they look. So we take the seed flat, and now larger, larger growers with multiple greenhouses, this is all done with machinery. They seed it, they transplant it, they've got conveyor systems. We're kind of like a dinosaur. But yet for the volume of plants we can grow, we could double this number easily. Which, which we did with 400,000 plants with seven people. So it's, it's not, I've learned over the years, it's not the production that is shortfalls, it's how do you get rid of this? How do you, these are all, this is like a fruit stand, these are all perishable products. Everything you see here has to be sold or has, has to have a next destination. So when you look at a perishable product, you have to, well, how much are we gonna grow? How much are we gonna sell? And you think about Northwind and the natural garden, when I was at the natural garden, we're, we're, we're reaching out to people. We're not selling you the traditional stuff. I don't know how many people have Baptisia sphericarpa, the yellow Baptisia, how many, and how many garden centers sell it? Probably none that, that really do it. So we've really been blessed that we have people that have a curious nature and a gardening nature to come to us, to come out to us over the last 30 years to be part of what Steve and Colleen and I were trying to do with everything. Not just plants, with, build, with stones, with rocks. We were sh trying to show people like Colleen would take stuff that a barn collapsed and all of a sudden that would be garden ornaments in the woods. Barn boards that people would burn all of a sudden get mounted up on building. Steve was taking cobblestones. I remember driving around with him and I, I don't want to pick up stones. That's, that's not what I'm used to doing. We stopped at all these farmers. They had stones piled in a field. Oops. We loaded all those stones up in a truck. He'd go at, we had cobbles we'd be bringing back. And that was his thing, was finding these unique stones and putting stone. So the three of us, that's what we did. We had our things we loved to do. And, we, and all of a sudden there were people like you with a nature of curiosity and seeing the same end result you started to kind of like what we were doing and coming out and supporting us. And that's why we're here 30 years. It's not because we're good business people. We're not, we're not business people. We, we just liked what we did and we found people that enjoyed the things we liked and we kept growing with that. And same with the people that have worked for us and the people that work for us now. It's, it's, if this was about making money, none of us would be here. And I, th and I think that's, the same with production. If you can do all this with machinery, why? But what they do with machinery are fashion plants they sell at Home Depot. It's the volume they want to sell. It's not the plant or the garden value. And what you have an interest in is I want to, I want to grow something that can last and have longevity to it. So this is the baptism. So simply what we do, we stay in, we work in the houses over there. You take a handful of the baptisias. Then we just pull them apart like this, shake off the soil, take two or three per pot. Look at those beautiful roots. Poke a hole in the soil, tuck the roots in there. And the key is, the key is you don't want to bury the crown. You don't, if you put the plants in too deep, you'll kill it. It's kind of like if I hold your head under water. Oh, you don't want to bury the crown of the plant. You want to put it in right at the soil level that germinated at. If you bury the crown, it'll rot. It's like 
if I hold your head underwater, I can kill you. That's such a small percentage of your, you know, it's such a small percentage of your body, but yet I can kill you simply by holding your head underwater. And that's what happens if you bury it too deep, the plant will die and rot. So you, you want to stay at the level they germinate at. Hmm? Right. What? I mean, you don't have to respect the root. Well, you just shake it off. The roots are... I mean, you can just jam... It looks like you just sort of jam it. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah, you just take it, you push it in. And that for about an hour, you're very conscientious. You're... <laughs> I think it's like... I've never had children, but I think it's like when you take your child home, you're afraid of doing anything. But then in a month or two months, you're throwing the kid to your husband. You're, you know, because... You, yes. Yeah, we use the same. Okay. No, it, actually it's a soil mix when it goes into this. Okay, we have a soil mix that's mixed for us and it has a, a pine fines, peat moss and sand. And we have a mix of about uh, five pounds of Osmocote per cubic yard. The Osmocote is a slow release fertilizer and that'll supply the plants with nutrients until we move them into a gallon or put them in the ground. So yeah, basically we just go through and when you, when you get a rhythm going, you, know, you can maybe do three, four hundred plants in a couple of hours. And you think of the, the size of the business we are, you know, you get a, if you can produce a plant, our cost of production, it's, it's probably 55 cents. And then the, the sales, we can we wholesale it up to $1.50 to $3, depending on the type of plant it is and the difficulty collecting the seed because there's difficulties within the process. Difficulties water. Some, some of the plants have to be hand watered. Some can go under sprinklers. And we found, I found all that out because I've killed everything. <laughs> so in 40 years of killing everything, I found who gets hand watered, who doesn't get hand watered, who can go under sprinklers and growth rate. The baptisia is to make a one gallon container it takes three years. So but you can sell it in one year to someone putting plugs in. You just have to make them aware it's a much slower grower. And that's, and that's really all there is. It's just, you take it, you, you put two together, you look at the depth, make your, think, poke, the, poke the roots in like he was saying. As long as you get the majority of roots in the soil, you backfill. Now how long do you keep them in that side? They can, they can last in here. A baptism can last in this pot for five years. Six years, maybe. We, we've had plants in 32s. Well, or we can put it in a bigger pot the following spring. This baptisia. Some of these plants, this is Agastache. This, this was seed in the refrigerator in May. Early, we sowed the seed in early May, late April. These, these are ready to go. You can take this home. Oh, yeah. And that's what I mean by miracles and magic. This was in the refrigerator in April. You want to take this home, you plant this now and have a plant that's flowering the following year. So they're, they're, not, they're not slow growers. Sometimes we get misled, we see a small plant like that and we think, oh, I'll never be able to grow that. They, they grow quickly. So we can put this in the gallon pot and have a gallon pot ready in about four weeks. But the trick is with the gallon pot, the plant keeps aging. When you put a plant in the pot and it keeps it keeps its reproductive cycle going and flowers. Every flowering stem on every plant dies and the plant moves new growth out sideways. So you only got so much time you can have a plant to have a healthy life in a container. And each plant's different. And then you look at the death rate of a plant in a container. Usually most growers look at 10% of what they do dies. One out of every 10 plants may die. It might get missed by water. It might be a poor plant going in the pot. There's so many different reasons. So, so there's a lot that goes into it, but it's no different than a fruit stand. You don't sell every banana. You don't sell every apple. So what do you do next with that? You can reproduce it, repot it, cut it back, or you pitch it. So you have to make decisions how things are flowing. So, but you can see if you're at home, you can grow four or 5,000 plants. You get some window screens, some plywood. <laughs> but the, the trick is, and, and it's like the trick with everything. What's, what's, the, what, what's the trick with anything you do? You have to do it. 
So I know a lot of people, I, they're not going to do this. They'd rather go jet skiing, bowling, and watch TV, Andy and Mayberry. The trouble is, if you do something like that, is to find enough friends who are willing to take it. I did basil like that well, last year, and nobody wanted to see me coming, because I was... Oh, well, you just... Have some basil. I would grow, I would grow it in a small pot. So if you grow baptisia, just grow everything in a small pot for yourself. You don't need to do high production, high volume. So we, I would, if I'm a homeowner, I'm using a six inch, I'm using this pot. I'm growing, I'll get 25, 30 plants of this, 25, 30 plants of that, I'll put two or three together. And if I pitch 50 plants, if the cost is so low, it doesn't matter. If I throw out this whole seed flat, we've, we've transplanted 500 of these already. And then we put gallons to speed the process up, we'll put two per pot in a gallon so we can speed it up a little bit. So we can sell the plants at a quicker pace. So tell me about the 30 percent shade. Is that equivalent to like maybe like an east, a east sunlight, or what, what is that equivalent to? It filters out 70 percent of the the power of the sun, or 30 percent of the power of the sun. So you got 70 percent of the sunlight. I have like an east side to my house, and I noticed that a lot of things do really well there. Yeah. But I don't know how. Much but those same things won't do well in. 80% light. They, each, each plant, it's like humans. If you lived a full life in Lake Geneva, Illinois, and all of a sudden your family moves to the Amazon basin, it's not going to be a good adjustment for you. You're going to have some issues. Yeah, so the plants, what the 30% shade does, the key is it lets enough light through to transition the plant into full sun or into full shade. So with 30% shade, you can go two directions. And the other thing 30% shade does, if we get like the, the, the storms we have now, we don't have summer showers anymore. We've got heavy rain, high winds, high damaging storm. When heavy rains come through this, it's all, if you're laying in this hut, it's like a mist coming. You can lay there like this and it's a mist coming on you. All that rain is broken into a mist. And that's why the seed, seedlings do so well. They're not bombarded by giant drops of rain coming down. But do you have other things that shade more than 30%? But we don't need it. You don't need those? No, just 50%, there's 50% there's more. As it goes, you can go from one to the other. Uh -huh. It's like living in, say you live in Florida, the Panhandle or something. Oh, I can go to Minneapolis, I can go to Costa Rica. You're kind of in the middle of where life can be. But if you're living in Minneapolis, it might be a rough time again going to the Costa Rica because you've had, you're, it's the life you're accustomed to and you're used to. It, it's tough, and some people don't care. You know, some people, th they can go anywhere. So for a full shade plant, you still use 30%? 30%, yeah. And they'll, they'll transition into full shade easily. If you put, if I had this 50%, I can't take a plant from 50% to sunlight. It, the foliage burns off. So I have a hard time sowing seeds and moving them. And we can, like all this went from a shade house right in the full sun. And that's because we have 30% shade. So. 30%, you got them in there as a nursery until they get to a certain point. Which you take it outside, put it in the full sun. Yeah. It's a full sun plant. Yeah. If it's shade, then you take it out of the hut and put it in the shade at that point. Then I leave it 30% shade. Yeah, it just stays right in there. Because you can take it from there and put it in there. And then we can take it and put it into a, a woodland garden. We can put it. So the full shade would stay inside of there. Yeah, yeah. All right, so any questions on this part of it? Well, I'll keep this here. And I'll tell you what, since I already went into this, and all of you, if you want to come up and get a handful of seedlings and take them home, you can transplant them into Dixie cups, punch a hole in the bottom, put some soil mix in. You got potting soil in the basement somewhere from potting up your house. Put the potting soil in. Yeah, just try it. So pass this around, take some, help yourself. Thank you, thank you so much, Roy. Now I want to show you vegetative production. Here, take that with Huh? <laughs> I like wine. <laughs> I'll quick show you vegetative production because we do about uh, about 50% of the plants we do vegetatively. So what we do is we dig the plants out of the ground or take them out of a pot like this 
This is Sanguisorba tana, and we just cut it back. Cut it back hard. Cut it back hard. We'll take it out of the pot or dig it out of the ground. And then we wash all the soil off. We got a hose system over there. Gabino washes all the soil off. This is Sanguisorba. So then if we dig it or take it out, here's the plant, kind of bare root. We take it apart. And then we start, look at all the small divisions we get. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's probably 25, 30 divisions here. And, and each plant is different. Some may only give you six, some may only give you 12. Each, each plant, like each person, you're, you're all, if, 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 one of you, if one of you, all of you go to the emergency room, the doctors are expecting the same kind of body parts. They're gonna find a heart and a lung, you know, so it's not like you're gonna surprise a doctor that you have an organ they've never seen. But yet you're different with the way you've cared for yourself, nurtured yourself, each organ might be under a different set of stress and different set of systems simply by the way you live. So they're gonna find those things. Each plant, is, each plant has different ways of growing, different growth rates. So you might not get all the divisions you'll get off this sanguisorba. You might get three, four, some asters, you might get 12. And then you understand that when you divide the plants. So then you take the division like this, and we simply do the same thing. It's like transplanting. We cut it back, put the hole in, put the plant in, and just backfill. Is there a point at which it's just too damn small to use? Too small? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some things are too small based on your conditions. Like Brent, who's over there at Intrinsic, he does have greenhouses with misting systems. He does a lot of things I can't do. So, but, but there's a lot of things I can do, so I try to focus on what I can do and do halfway well, and then buy in the stuff I can't do from people that can do it. So it just makes sense instead of spending, spending time trying to root cuttings I can't root and putting up plastic. Oh yeah, you could cut this off too. You could, you could prune it so it's easier to pot. And then you just go through and, and pot them up like that. So at the end of a day, like here, I, I, when I, this one plant, Plus what I got left, that might have yielded me a whole flat of 32s. And the same time period, I'll wait three to six weeks, and I got a plant I can sell to you for three dollars, or I can put in a gallon, I can put in a quart. I can make decisions where they go and how they, what their next uh, moment in life will be. And I'm assuming if you've got one in a gallon pot that didn't sell, it's getting leggy and getting that. That's what we do in the fall. This yeah, this, this one I'd wait another year because it's still saleable. In the fall, there's plants here that you have to decide to pitch or divide or repot. And then I have to look at the value of repotting. It's, it's more economical to pitch it and grow a new one than it is to try to save a little piece of it. And other ones I can divide into 20 pieces, put in a tray, and if I have enough time, they'll root in here before winter. Or I can just repot it, put it fresh soil, and have another plant again. Well, a lot of things I can't grow from seed. They're, they need to be vegetative because there are selections based on certain characteristics. So you do cuttings or divisions because you want to keep those characteristics. Other things I do from seed, like echinacea, is I scatter all kinds of different seeds because I want, I, I don't want everything to look the same. I don't want the same red stems, the same flat flowers. I want shades of red. And like echinacea north wind, that hybridized with the plant here, that's very tall flowers all summer but the cool thing is none of you would ever buy it because in a bench it looks terrible it doesn't present well in retail so every year you sell four and then in the garden right now they're in bloom people what is that one echinacea you have oh that's north wind then they go to the bench and look at it in a pot 
I don't think I want them. So, so it, it, it's a plant with garden value. It's purple coneflower. And they're, they're spaced out farther and they bloom much longer. But it still doesn't help because it doesn't look good to you. And if, and if it doesn't look good to you, you're just not going to buy it. You can't help that. That's just the nature of people. Do you always go to 32 cells from, from that stage? Yeah, it gives me options to plant this, pot it up, okay. or I can use this in a project. Because we're doing more and more projects with this size plant because of economics. Yeah. If I put this in the ground, if, if the people we put it in the ground for are good parents, mm -hmm. this will equal a gallon in six weeks. So you can go from three to 350, six weeks, six, this. So, but most people are, when they see, most shoppers aren't gonna buy this because they know they can't, they, they have their, they, they've created a story in their life that they cannot get this to live. What is it's not the plant, it's the size. No one will buy this, very few people buy this size plant because they have a story they made up in their mind, it's too small. Is that why some of the, main, the, the, the mainstream greenhouses have moved away from that size pot into the big four inch pot? I have oh, yeah. increasingly over the years when I'm shopping for plants in the spring that I cannot find little four packs or eight packs that everything is coming in the big four. Yeah, well it's more pot. profitable. I'm sure the profit margin yeah, is there for yeah. them. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's profitable. In a, working in a greenhouse, we expect things to sell really quickly, and, and having to maintain the, the watering and the weeding and right. whatnot. You gotta get, do you gotta get rid of the small ones in a heartbeat, too. So, 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 in a lot of ways, sales are dependent on the knowledge clients have, customers have, and it's no offense to the United States, but we're not, we, 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 we never became a gardening nation. We're not, we're not a nation of gardeners. We're a nation of people that like to garden, but we don't know what we're doing. And we, that happened, World War II took us away from that because anhydrous ammonia chemicals came out of World War II. And all of a sudden the chemical companies, they wanted to sell this explosive stuff. They wanted to turn into agriculture. And that's why all those fields out there are chemically driven. They don't rotate crops anymore. There's no knowledge of husbandry of land. It's used anhydrous ammonia, soybeans and corn, and that's the way we live. So 1950, you had, all of us could have been socially gardening outside every day, because that's all was happening in the 30s. Every magazine you read, families would go out, Jimmy, can you pass me the pruners? How was school today? Come over and help me with this one area. That's, that was where we were going. And then we had I-80 go in, out west and dinosaur sing and see the USA in your Chevrolet. Yeah. And the marketing people said, we're changing the language from gardening to yard work. What about the seasons? And when the, like, what do you do with all this stuff over the winter? It all stays right here. We, we cover it with microfoam and plastic. And then we, we go dormant like the plants do. So we cover it, just say it's covered with plastic. We put microfoam as insulation blanket. We cut everything back, put it down, put white plastic over it. And then we wait till spring and right over the pots. Right over the pots. Right yeah, we cut everything down, clean it up, microfoam, and then we have stage potting. So we'll be potting what we don't have. It's a cycle. Of, yeah, it's breathable, but it it insulates the pots from freezing and thawing. Yeah, yeah it all works. And you leave them upright. Yeah, yeah. Every every it's a system that works. And you, then things die. Like I said, you got 10% loss. And you got to pitch it. So in the spring one we uncover, we the quickest get rid of everything that's dead right away, and that way I look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so the first thing we do, dump all the dead stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's when you when you get a when you get more days in the 40s. And then we uncover everything. And then it can get down to 12, 15 again, because the plant's been through the worst of it. If you wait too long, growth will happen under the plastic, then you gotta keep covering every night. So it's... Well, thanks for sharing this time with me. Yeah, I...
when we take these guys home and put them in a small container, yeah. how long before we can put them safely in the ground? Well, just as soon as they root into that container. Okay. And when you see them rooted into the pot, you can plant them. Two or three together? Or yeah, you can put two or three together. That's fine. Yeah, once they root into that pot, you can plant them. No, yeah, you want to mark them.